Now, last Wednesday, I touched on how God revealed His acts to the Israelites, but He revealed His ways, His deeper motives and character to Moses. And it was on Mount Horeb that Moses asked God to show him his ways. And after God promised him his presence and to give him rest, Exodus 33, 18 to 19 reads, Moses said, God, show me your glory, please. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. At the center of God's glory is His incomparable goodness. At Mount Horeb, God revealed His goodness also to Elijah. By the time Prophet Elijah got to Mount Horeb, however, he was a discouraged, burned out and depressed prophet. His soul needed refreshment and renewal by the goodness of God. Elijah had undergone a lot, mostly highs, over the past three and a half years. After prophesying to King Ahab that there will be no rains over Israel, Elijah was instructed by God to go hide by a little brook called Kerith. Here, in the middle of a drought, Elijah had a water source and he was miraculously fed by ravens. But the water in the brook dried up after some time and God told him to go to the city of Zarephath where a widow was commanded to feed Elijah. It turns out it was a very poor widow. When Elijah met her, he asked her for some bread and she said in 1 Kings 17 verse 12, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son and we may eat it and die. So basically, she was preparing their last meal. Elijah tells her, Do not fear. First, make me a little cake out of the flour and the oil, bring it to me, and afterward, make something for yourself and your son. Would there be leftover flour and oil for the widow and son? Probably not. But I, and I think most of us would have hesitated uh, to, to obey Elijah. But the widow did as Elijah instructed, and what was the outcome of her faith? The oil and the flour did not run out and they miraculously multiplied over and over and over again. And both her, her son, Elijah, and her, three of them, were fed throughout the, the drought. And then when the widow's son died, verse 21 says, Elijah stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the son lived again. Amazing miracle performed by Elijah. Now in the third year, God gave Elijah the word to go show himself to King Ahab. And Elijah told Ahab he would like to challenge the false prophets of Baal. And on Mount Carmel, Elijah successfully challenged the 450 false prophets of Baal. And the challenge was to call fire from heaven to burn the offering on an altar. Despite their best efforts, the false prophets were unable to call down fire from heaven because Baal, their God, does not exist. Elijah called out to God a simple prayer and verse 1 Kings 18.38 records that the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the, and the dust and the fire licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The 450 false prophets were killed that day. 
And soon the heavens opened and rain fell over Israel for the first time in three and a half years. What a great day, right, for Elijah. What a great day. It's like, you know, it's the culmination of the three and a half years of being hidden away from the limelight. But instead of having lots of people turning from worshipping Baal to God, Elijah faced a death threat from the wicked queen Jezebel. So Elijah fled. The Bible says he ran for his life. He ran a day's journey alone into the wilderness. And he sat under a broom tree and he asked God to take away his life. He felt crushed and discouraged. He had given his very best and yet he was unable to effect a national revival. Logically speaking, he needn't have feared the Queen Jezebel. God had come through for him every time over the past three and a half years. After all, he never suffered want. He was fed by ravens, fed by a, fed by a very poor widow. He raised the widow's sons back to life. He called down fire from heaven. He had been on a spiritual high all these past years and now he's in the deepest valley. There are two things that stand out for me in this account. One, Elijah was afraid, afraid of losing his life. Two, Elijah made a comparison to other people. He started saying, I'm no better than my fathers. I've accomplished nothing. And Elijah started to make believe something. He began to th believe this story that God, you came through for me, yes, in the past, but I'm not sure you can come through again. God, what's going to happen tomorrow? True, I've seen you defeat Baal, but have you seen the wicked queen Jezebel? You know, he felt so lousy and he lost hope. Now, brother or sister, whenever we lose hope, we also lose faith. Because Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. So when you lose hope, you do lose faith. Without hope or faith, you also lose pers you will lose perspective, especially eternal perspective. And life feels empty, useless. Elijah's despair came mostly from false expectations he had placed on himself. It is so easy, you know, our minds are so active, it's so easy to imagine the outcome of our efforts or how our life will turn out. Whether very good or very bad, it's so easy to imagine. And when the reality is worse than expected, we find it very hard to accept. In his discouragement and self-pity, Elijah withdrew from people. Now, whenever people isolate themselves, their sense of loneliness is heightened. Often, when we isolate ourselves, we only hear the very loud echo of our own negative voice, and, and that negative voice magnifies all our problems and challenges. And we struggle to hear the encouragement from God. Eventually, Prophet Elijah withdrew and he hid in a cave in Mount Horeb. And then God spoke to him, asking him a couple of times, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeated his rant, I have been very zealous for you, Lord. But the sons of Israel have all abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. And I, I alone am left and they have sought to take my life. Not just Jezebel, but all the sons of Israel now want to take his life, he says. Elijah was a faithful and powerful prophet of God. He tried hard, he suffered too. So why did he collapse into a heap simply 
because of a verbal threat from a, from a queen. I believe it was because he was carrying the heavy burden. He felt the heaviness of the burden of Israel's revival somehow falling on his shoulders alone. Whose responsibility is that actually? It's God's. It's not Elijah's. And this is a lesson to all of us who are leaders at home or in the ministry. We must not assume the place of God. The things that God does, we must not take over. We must not also take over the burden. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. God said to Elijah, Go and stand out. Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Wow, God showed up. And a great and a strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. The Lord was not in the strong wind, nor was he in the earthquake of fire, meaning that God caused these things, but he was not in them. All of these, the wind, earthquake and fire, are familiar symbols of God's presence to Elijah. Only recently, fire fell down from heaven after Elijah prayed. But God was going to reveal himself in a new way to Elijah with the sound of a low whisper. In other translations, it says, in a still small voice or the sound of a gentle blowing. Oftentimes, we look for obvious and very loud signs to tell us that God is in our midst, that God is working. We look for dramatic signs. In fact, strong winds, earthquakes and fires are the signs of the times we are living in. But we need to recognise God even when there are no dramatic manifestations to grab our attention. God wants us to enter into a relationship with Him, one that is based on His Word, one that is based on our waiting for His guidance and his whisper, not merely on phenomenon or signs. When Elijah heard the low whisper of God, he felt the weight of his holy presence and Elijah wrapped his face in his cloak. This is so meaningful. How many of us hide our faces when in the presence of God? See, Elijah recognised that God said, no, man cannot see God and live. And 1 Timothy 6 verse 16, God alone has immortality. He dwells in unapproachable light. We cannot approach God on our own merits. You know, God no one has ever seen or can see. So Elijah covered his face, went out and he obeyed God and he stood at the entrance of the cave. Yet he was still in self-pity mode. He was still down and out, but God persisted and God gave him a new commission. So Elijah, you are done with this mission and you feel that you are burnt out. You can't do it anymore. I've got a new mission for you. Sometimes we feel that we cannot serve God anymore. There is a limit to what we can do. But God is inexhaustible and God will give you a new assignment. So Elijah went out, he, he did all the things God told him to do and he ended well. In fact, Elijah ended so well, he didn't even see death. But he was taken up to God in a chariot of fire. What a way to go and see what God can do for someone who felt like he wasn't good enough anymore. Be encouraged today, my brother and sister. And now let's look to God in prayer. Dear Lord, 
We have all told ourselves toxic and negative, destructive thoughts. We have all been in Elijah's shoes, disappointed, despondent, have entertained thoughts of even ending life or feeling sorry for ourselves. Teach us, God, to stop looking for dramatic signs of your love or your care for us. You are constant, God, and teach us always to stop listening to the echo of our own negative thoughts, own negative voices, you know, but to be able to hear the low, gentle whisper of your voice. God, you dwell in unapproachable light and we are so unworthy. We hide our faces as if from you, God, because you are holy and you are just and pure. And yet, God, you long to walk with us and to live with us. We are truly grateful and we praise you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.